Happy Sabbath, everybody. Oh, my goodness. I feel like I want to walk off stage right now. Your Happy Sabbath is a very sad Sabbath. <laughs> Let's do it one more time. Happy Sabbath, everybody. Okay. All right. That's right. That's right. That's right. Thank you for, for that. I want to greet you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He is good and he's still king, in case you don't know. And I'm happy that he has been so good to sustain us until today. And we can be here to worship the Lord for his, for his goodness. So we are beginning a new series today called Becoming. Michelle Obama says something in her book, Becoming. She says that when you ask somebody what you want to become, it's really not a great question. Because we are forever in a process of becoming. Are we together? What you are today is not what you were last year. And what you'll be next year is not what you are right now. And this is important because sometimes we are stuck on where we are instead of looking at where God has taken us from and where he intends to take us to. So we hope to help you in this series to see how there were some people around the cross that they were just like you. They got angry just like you. They got mad just like you. But Jesus made them into apostles. Jesus made them into preachers of the gospel. And I want you to know that God has great aspirations and hopes in you that you can become as great as a Paul, as great as a Peter, as great as a Mark or a Moses. Amen, somebody. Amen. All right, no problem. Let's work on this thing. In Mark chapter 14, uh, that is where we're going to spend time in. And look with me in verse number 43. Mark chapter 14 and verse number 43. When you got it, say amen. Amen. Amen, amen in the back. Amen. Let us read this thing. Mark chapter 14 and verse number 43. The Bible says, And immediately, while he was speaking, Judas came, one of the twelve, and with a crowd, with swords and clubs, from the chief priests and the scribes and the elders, Judas, <laughs> Judas. Now the betrayer had given him a sign, saying, the one I will kiss, seize him and lead him away under guard. I hope you're listening. And when he came, he went up to him at once and said, Rabbi. And he kissed him. And when they laid hands on him, and they laid hands on him and seized him. But one of those who stood by drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. Ouch. Hmm. That's a disciple. A disciple of Jesus used a knife. Think about that. And Jesus said to them, have you come out as against a robber? With swords and clubs to capture me. Day after day I was with you in the temple. Teaching. And you did not seize me. But let the scripture be fulfilled. And they all. Peter, James, John. And they all. Left him. And fled. If you've ever been abandoned. Jesus was there too. Verse 51, and the young man followed him with nothing but a linen cloth about his body. And they seized him, but he left the linen cloth and ran away naked. Today the topic is called a chameleon 
of circumstances. A chameleon of circumstances. Let us pray. Mighty God, please do what you do so that I can do what I can. And so that you can help somebody do what you want them to do. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So I read a riddle on Reader's Digest that I found interesting. And I want to see if you can help me to solve it. You go at red. You stop at green. What am I? Anybody? What are we talking about? I heard somebody. Tra you don't go at red at the traffic light, Dickie. What's going on? <laughs> the, uh, okay, all right. Anybody? Not a traffic light, Dickie. Yes, Maddie. Watermelon. A watermelon says, go at red, you eat it, and at green, you stop. Today, I want to solve another riddle. How come that when we face challenging situations, instead of responding with faith, we can respond with our natural instincts? Instead of staking our claim and standing on the promises, we move from the promises to the position of whatever is a problem to us. I also react with my natural instincts. I don't know about you, but sometimes when I struggle with the problem, I found myself procrastinating to get it done. And sometimes I will lay on my bed a little bit longer thinking about what I'm supposed to do. Instead of writing the paper or writing the sermon, I will scroll on Instagram and I can burn an hour or two hours. That's my natural instinct sometimes when I meet a challenge and a difficulty. And I believe that you also have your natural instinct. Perhaps when things are not working out, your natural instinct is to get angry and get fussy. Perhaps your natural instinct is, I'm not going to go to church. Perhaps your natural instinct is, I'm not going to reply to the message. Perhaps your natural instinct is, I'm going to give them the silent treatment until they bow at my feet. Yeah, you believe God is good. Yeah, you believe that with God you can. But yet, when you face a difficulty, you feel like you can't. So I want us to explore why is it that when we face challenges, instead of responding with faith, we tend to respond with our natural instincts. I believe that many of us are like a chameleon. You may not know what a chameleon is. Maybe you do. I've never seen one in Indonesia. I haven't yet. I'm sure they are, but I haven't yet. But in my country, there are a lot of chameleons. And one of the things that was amazing about chameleons is that whenever you touch them, they will react in a different way and they will change color. Sometimes they will take the color of your clothes. And I believe that some of us are like millions. When the situation changes, we change with the situation. If they are mad, we get mad. If they are happy, we get happy. If they get sad, we get sad. If they lose, we lose. But we believe in God. We believe we can with God. Judas comes. With a mob. Charlene, Jesus comes with a mob. Not like the mob that surrounded LeBron James when he achieved the all-time scoring record. 
This mob comes because they want to attack Jesus. I wondered, Brother Sutarsa, what makes a disciple approach his master with clubs and swords? One thing came to my mind, something has changed. Jesus is no longer what he was to Peter. Peter, P Judas, sees Jesus as an enemy. Many of us believe that Judas betrayed Jesus. We know that. But you, have you ever asked yourself the question, why did Judas betray Jesus? Many of you may tell me, Judas betrayed Jesus because he was after money. Many of you will say, Judas betrayed Jesus because, well, uh, he, he just changed all of a sudden. I want to suggest something that maybe you have not thought about. Jesus, to me, betrayed Jesus because he wanted to unleash the power of Jesus. You would never think of fraud as a good thing. You would never think of getting cheated on as a good thing. You would never think of getting lied on as a good thing. Betrayal hurts. Amen, somebody? And perhaps you're right here. Listen to me. You have been betrayed. You have been hurt. You've been cheated on. You've been defrauded. But I want you to think of the mind of Judas. Judas is thinking, I'm going to betray Jesus so that Jesus can unleash his power. Pastor, mm, I don't ag agree with you. Just help me to help you. Notice how Judas comes to Jesus. Uh, he, he says to the, to the mob that is arresting him, he says, the one I will kiss is the man, seize him and lead him away under guard. Judas came prepared for a resistance. He would not give those instructions if he thought, well, <laughs> Jesus, Jesus is, is a weak guy. He's a... You can just take him at, at any cost. Uh, but, but, but Judas is thinking about the one who resurrected people from the dead. Jesus, Judas is thinking about the one who is able to walk on water. And Judas is thinking, if we just arrest Jesus, <laughs> all hell is going to break loose. If we just touch him, he's going to say, don't touch me. I am God. Who are you? In fact, in fact, the text says, the text says that Judas, Judas says, he says, what, what, what does Judas, Judas say? Forgive me, y'all. <laughs> My brain has, 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 has left me. Preachers also forget. Amen, somebody? You better be praying so that the Lord will give me the right things to say right now. But what doesn't happen is Judas unleashing himself. I'm confusing Judas and Jesus. Forgive me. Let me get it straight. What doesn't happen is Jesus doesn't unleash himself. Jesus submits himself. The plan doesn't work. And in fact, I know it doesn't work because when Judas realizes what has happened to Jesus, the Bible says that Judas was remorseful. He regretted the whole situation because you know why? He was trying to force Jesus into something that Jesus was not ready to do. You see, Judas became a chameleon of circumstances because he tried to get Jesus to do what Jesus never intended to do. 
Now, I want to be careful when I say this. I have people in the house this morning that are assertive. You're the kind of person who will never take no for an answer. You're the kind of person who will make sure that it is done. You're the kind of person who doesn't take no nonsense from anybody. I want to be careful when I tell you this. Please understand that people are not things that you force. They are beings who choose. Yes, force is important. I need force to walk. When you're walking, you're applying force to the ground. When you're in your car, you're pushing the car, the accelerator to move. You need force. Force is important and it is good. But people are not things. People are not a car. People are not a, a bike. People are not your legs. People are human beings who need to decide for themselves. Jesus had decided that I will not use my force. I will not unleash my power. Judas was trying to get Jesus to do something that he never intended to do. And so when Jesus, Judas is thinking about this situation, he says to himself, I have sinned. I have betrayed somebody who was innocent. I should not have forced him to do what I wanted him to do. Oh yeah, parents, let me talk to you for a second. I know you want your kids to be the best in the world. Amen, parents? Amen. And you will suggest to them things they should do. You will tell them places to apply. But it may just happen that your kids don't want to do it. The answer is not to push them to do it. The answer is to say, you know what? They have decided. I've done the best that I could. Let me leave them to their decisions. Kids, I know you want your mom or your dad to take the medication, to go get the checkup. In fact, you're willing to fly them outside, overseas, so that they can get the treatment that they need. But if they tell you, I don't want to do it, you have got to respect that and say, don't, okay, daddy, mommy, you don't want to do it. And that doesn't mean that you're a bad person. It simply means that you understand that people are not things that you force. They're human beings who choose. And so Judah says, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood and throwing down the piece of silver into the temple. He departed and went and hanged himself. You see, when you force things, you might end up like Judas, not hanging yourself, but you might end up killing the relationship. You might end up being the, the bad guy. You might end up destroying things. And so it's important that you respect the choices of people. If that makes sense, can you say amen? But Peter chose a different tactic. Judas wanted to force Jesus Peter decided to back up Jesus. And what is interesting is that as soon as Jesus is arrested, Sister Kevin, <laughs> Peter took a knife and he sliced the ear of the servant of the high priest. Now, let me tell you, all I used to think that Peter was a weak disciple. I used to think that Peter was the kind of guy who would just go with the wind. But I got a different vision of Peter today or this week. Is that Peter is willing to stand up for Jesus. He's willing to die for Jesus. He's willing to say, you know what? I'm going to go out for my Lord. If I have to kill somebody while I'm trying to support and stand up for my Lord, I'm going to do it. But what the problem is this. Is that... <laughs> Is that what Peter doesn't understand is that he has not yet learned to appreciate that it's okay to take a loss. That you do not have to win every single time. Now, now you might tell me, Pastor, I've been taking a lot of losses in my life. This week, you don't know how much money I've lost. You don't understand the disease that has been ravaging my body. You don't understand the stress that I'm going on that is going on at work. Pastor, you don't get it. The conflicts that I'm going through, they're just driving me crazy. And you might say, Pastor, no, I have to fight. And I tell you, go ahead and fight. If you've been fired unfairly, please go ahead and fight. If somebody has cheated on you, please go ahead and confront it. But sometimes the answer is not fight it. 
Sometimes the answer is, I'll just accept it. Sometimes the answer is, it's okay that it is like this. It's okay that things didn't go my way. It's okay that I don't like it, but I will accept it. This loss I'm going to take. I was, I was talking to my friend uh, the other day, and she told me a story about her daughter. They were playing a game. It was a board game. And the game required them to put together pieces to form words. And consistently, the daughter could not form words because she's only three. So she's still learning how to speak. So she would only form B-I-N. But consistently, the parents would form the complete word. And you know what the little girl did? She threw the board. <laughs> she says, Mommy, it's unfair. Why are you the one winning all the time? And so the mom and the dad changed the tactic. What he decided to do is to let her win. And when she won, she said, Mommy, it's okay. I'm going to teach you how to win. And the mommy says, no, honey, it's not for me. The lesson is for you. I want you to know that it's okay to take a loss. I want you to learn that sometimes things will not go your way, and that's okay. And this is what I hope somebody hears me today, that yes, things haven't worked out. You don't like it. Instead of throwing the board, instead of reacting, why not say, you know what, God? That's how you have intended to be. That's how it is for me. That's okay. I'm going to accept it. And we need more Christians like that. We need more people who are willing to give the other side of the cheek. We need more people who are willing to say, you know what? They, 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 they talked about me, but I'm okay greeting them at church anyway. My brother, you don't know about him, pastor. You don't know what he's done to me, pastor. But you said that I should still love him after he did that to me? Okay, pastor, I'll do that. You don't win by fighting all the time. Sometimes the fight is put down your gloves. Sometimes you win the fight by just being quiet. Husbands. Only the young men got it because they don't understand husbands. You know, the Dickie and the boys here laughed. They don't get it yet. I also don't get it. But I've been told, when your wife is talking to you, just, just be quiet. <laughs> it's going to be all right. So sometimes we win the fight by taking a loss. And what might that look like? It simply may be my parents don't believe that I'm, I'm smart enough. I can make decisions for myself. That's okay. That's what they believe. I'm going to accept that. It may be. My kids are not ever going to follow me. They're never going to take the family business. They're never going to think like me. That's okay. I'm going to take this loss anyway. I'm never going to be promoted. It's okay. I'm never going to be loved as I think I should be loved. And that's okay. And that's why when, 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 when Peter, watch this. When, when, when Peter sliced the neck of, or the ear of the high priest servant, Jesus said, no more of this. And I came to tell you, no more of the fighting. No more of the complaining. No more of the politicking. No more. No more. And notice what happened. The Bible says Jesus healed the man. Jesus healed the man. Because Peter stopped fighting. If you stop fighting, you're going to be healed. Sometimes I struggle. Let me be honest with you. I can, I can sit on my bed and I become like the, the, the history on your web browser. I start to count the things that people have done wrong to me. Counting, counting, replaying, replaying. Sometimes I click in my mind. Go back to the website and scroll again on what happened and how it worked out. And God said to me, Henry, no more. No more of this. Let it go. And you're going to be healed. And here it is. Jesus said to Peter, he says, put your sword into the sheath. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father has given me to drink? You see, Judas was trying to force Jesus to unleash his power. Peter was trying to stop Jesus from being arrested. Jesus says, hold up. 
Judas, you're wrong. Peter, you're wrong. Because you don't understand that I have a cup to drink. You don't understand that I have a mission to accomplish. You don't get the fact that my life is not just to be here on earth. My life is not just to do miracles. My life is not just to walk on water. My life is not just to resurrect people from the dead. My life is not just to talk about parables. I have a cup to drink. I have something that I must do. What the problem is this. The disciples, Peter and Judas, did not understand what God was doing. And here it is. The big takeaway of the sermon today. When what God is doing is more important than what's happening around you. We've all been in this situation. You go to the airport, and uh, when you get there, it's a line. Unless you travel first class, of course. But most of us, you got to go through the line, and the line can, can be long. Now, legit, legit, when I was coming to Indonesia for the first time in 2017 to come and be pastor here, I, I, I preached at a church, and the church member was kind enough, Brother Tarsa do, to, to give me his pass at the airport, Lilongo International Airport. When I got there, I mean, when, when I got there, let's let just say that I felt like I was the president. When I got there, took my luggage, took my passport, and says, Pastor, sir, he didn't say pastor, sir, go and sit in the office over there. So I went and I sat. I'm with my dad, my sister, we are talking. I'm starting to think, wait, I got to catch a flight. I've not checked in. He says, no, nah, don't worry. When the flight is ready, we're going to call you. <laughs> the flight was ready, and I was called. I said bye to my dad, said bye to my sister. And then the man led me. I, was, I didn't see a plane, Andre. I saw a Mercedes. I said, wait a minute. <laughs> I'm going to fly in a Mercedes? He says, no, sir, please enter. I entered the Mercedes. The Mercedes drove all the way to the tarmac at the airport. <laughs> I got out. I walked up on the plane. Everybody looked at me like I was going to sit in first class. But my ticket said economy. I passed by those first class seats and I sat in economy. Are you, are you feeling what I'm saying? Many times when you go to the airport, that's the experience that we have. We have to wait. We never have good treatment. We have to wait our time until we sit in the plane. But eventually we do sit. Eventually we do get on the flight and we go. Even though the process takes long. Even though it may, it may be difficult. And what I'm trying to help somebody understand is this. Just because you do not see it, doesn't mean that God is not working. <sighs> Can I try it another way? Just because you don't understand what God is doing, it doesn't mean that God is not doing something. Because many times when we are at the airport, we are frustrated with the line. But the person at the end of the line is busy punching in numbers, making sure that every passenger gets on the plane, the right passenger, making sure that he's protecting you so that you can get there on your journey. Eventually, when you're patient enough, you find yourself in the plane and you travel. I came to tell a child of God today, you may not know what's going on. It may not make sense. You may be broke. They may be talking about you, but God is doing something. Eventually, you're going to get on the journey. God is at work, even though you can't see it. Pastor, I've been praying. It's been five years. I know. It took Abraham 25. <laughs> Pastor, I've been praying. I've been sick. It took the woman with the issue of blood 12 years. What I, what I want you to know is that God works the same. Uh, he's the same. What he did in the past is what he's doing right now. And so please, child of God, just know that your situation is going to change. 
it's going to get better. What you need to do is to keep on holding on to God. And this is how Jesus responded, Brother Gunawan, to those who arrested him. Because the disciples are trying to stop him. Judas is trying to unleash him. But when Jesus responds to the arresting officers, Brother Jeff, notice what he says. Have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs to capture me? David, watch this. Day after day, I was with you in the temple teaching. And you did not seize me. This is the most important part. But let the scripture be fulfilled. Judas and Peter saw an arrest. But Jesus saw salvation in progress. Jesus is not stuck on what is happening around him. Brother Nick, Jesus is saying, something is happening right now. God is moving right now. He is doing something right now. It doesn't feel like it. I don't like it. I'm, I don't like the fact that they're arresting me. But the scripture is coming to life. Oh, child of God, I used to think, I used to think that sometimes when runners put on their glasses to run, they're being, how do we say it, sambong. <laughs> they're being proud. But I learned something. That sometimes when runners put on their glasses, it's because it's too bright. And because it's too bright, they need glasses to be able to see. And so the glasses allow them to get a clear picture so that they can keep on running. And the answer, what glasses are you wearing? What are you looking at your problems through? Yes, you got fired. Yes, you are sick. Yes, the kids are messing up. Yes, the business ain't right. But the question is, how are you looking at it like? Elder Ray, what, what glasses do you have on? Jesus had on the scriptures, and the scriptures helped him to see. Twitter is not going to help you to see. Instagram is not going to help you to see. The newspaper is not going to help you to see. When you look at the debits and the credits, it's not going to help you to see. The text message you got from your boss is not going to help you to see. You know what's going to help you to see? The scripture. Mm. You know what's going to help you to see? What God says. Now, in order for you to see with what God says, you've got to have what God says in your head. So, what is helping you to see? What is guiding your decision making? When the situation changes, what is your interpretation over that particular situation? You see, circumstances will shake you when you can't see what God is doing. God was clear about what he was doing because when, when Peter identified that Jesus is the Messiah, Jesus said to Peter, I'm going to die. Jesus said to Peter, my day is coming. But notice how Peter reacted. Peter took aside Jesus. Jesus, what are you talking about, Lord? You cannot die. You are God. But Jesus says, listen, Peter, you don't understand what's going on. And could it be, could it be that God is working? That we understand. We get what's going on, but we're just not willing to accept it. And therefore, our struggle is not so much that we don't understand what God says. But our struggle is, we don't, un we don't want to accept what God says. We say, God, this one, Tirabisa. I know you want me to go left, <laughs> but God, I, I desire to go right. God, this is the one that I love. This is the one I want to be with. God, this is the, 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 the startup I want to start. God, this is the career I want to pursue. I get it. I know you want to do that. But perhaps this is a better plan. And so many times you and I are struggling, not because we don't get it, 
but because we don't want to accept it. When you can't see what God is doing, that's when you become a chameleon of circumstances. That's when you struggle. And this is exactly what happened to the disciples. And they all left him and fled. And I'm almost at the end. The musicians can come. And they all left him and fled. And a young man followed him with nothing but a linen cloth about his body. And they seized him. But he left the linen cloth and ran away naked. Chameleon of circumstances. They say Jesus is about to die. He, he. I don't think this is a place we need to be, Sister Alicia. Mm. This one is too hot for us. It's too difficult for us. The only thing that we can do is run away. And that's where somebody is today. You are running away. You're not willing to stand the heat. You're not willing to stand in, in the situation. So what you do is, you run away. Natural instincts. But here it is, child of God. Jesus knew that Peter and Judas and the rest of them will become chameleon in circumstances because he said, you will all fall away. Because when I'm, I'm beaten, when I'm hit, you will scatter like roaches. Jesus wasn't surprised that the disciples betrayed him. He predicted it. Because Jesus knew that their faith would be overwhelmed. Jesus knew that it would not be easy to digest that the one who has so much power to heal could allow himself to be arrested. Jesus understood that they would not take it so well when they saw him not standing up for himself in front of the priests. Jesus knew that it would not go well with them when they saw him being beaten. He understood that their faith would be overwhelmed by the circumstances. And I need you to know that God also understands when your faith is overwhelmed too. He knows that the loss of your loved one is too hard for you to handle. He knows that the fact that your cash flow is tight is difficult for you to handle. He knows that the the heartbreak has broken you. He knows that you cannot handle the stress that you're getting at work. He, he knows that you are, you're struggling to pray. He knows that you have a difficult time dealing with your family. He knows how painful it is in the marriage. And you want to walk out. He, he knows that. But here's what you need to know. Jesus said, I know you will fall. But when I am raised up, I will meet you in Galilee. In other words, I will be a chameleon that is going to be able to adapt to your situation. And I'm going to help you in your fall. I will be like a pillow that you can fall on. I will be there to hold you down. That's what God is telling you today. I'm here. I want to hold you down. It's difficult, I know. But I'm here. You don't have to tell me what happened. Just accept what I did for you. Pastor, I'm ready to meet Jesus today. I'm ready to meet Jesus. Anybody? 
I'm ready to meet Jesus. If you raise your hand, please stand to your feet. I want to pray with you. You know why the disciples fell? They fell because they did not embrace the Jesus that he presented to them. So if you're going to accept Jesus, please embrace the Jesus he is presenting himself to you as. Not the picture of your Jesus. Because when you accept the Jesus who he is as, then you will become. You will grow. You'll be better. Every head is bowed. Every set of eyes is closed as we pray. Father God, many times like the disciples, we are chameleon of circumstances. We respond with our natural instincts. But Father, we appreciate Jesus. That in spite of our natural instincts, he's right there to catch us when we fall. And I want to pray for a brother and a sister today that feels fallen and, and broken. I pray, Father, that they may fall in the arms of Jesus. He already went ahead. He already died. He already did it all. And so, Lord, I pray that you'd help us not to come to you with our ideas about you, but we'll come to you with our ideas of you. Please, Father, strengthen us and bless us and lift us up today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. God bless you.